This lecture is part of an online graduate course on Lie groups and will be about the exponential map. So the exponential map is a map x from a Lie algebra L to the corresponding Lie group G. And it's very easy to define in the special case that the Lie group G is a matrix group by which we mean a closed subgroup of the general linear group. In this case, we can just define the exponential map of a matrix A to be 1 plus A plus A squared over 2 factorial plus A cubed over 3 factorial and so on. <clears throat> so here A is an n by n matrix over the reals. Um, we should check convergence of this series, but this is very easy to do because what we do is we just choose a norm on r to the n, I don't really care what norm, and we can define um, the norm of a matrix A to be the norm of A is the supremum of A of V over V for V non-zero, and this easily implies the norm of A B is less than or equal to the norm of A times the norm of B and so on. And you can then check that the series for x of A is absolutely convergent in much the same way that it is for the usual exponential function of the, um, of the reals. We can also check it has some fairly obvious properties. For example, x of A plus B is equal to x of A times x of b if a b equals b a. So the proof of this is very similar to the proof of the similar relation for real numbers, except you do need to use convergence at some point. In particular, x of lambda a um, plus mu a is equal to x of lambda a times x of mu a for any lambda and mu that are real. So the function taking lambda to exp of lambda a is a homomorphism of groups from the reals to um, whatever group you're working with, say GLN of R. So in other words, the exponential map turns elements of the Lie algebra into um, one parameter group one parameter groups in GLR. That, that means a homomorphism from the reals to the group. Um, well, so far we've only defined the exponential map for matrix groups. We can ask what about exp for non-matrix groups? Um, well, first of all, there are some non-matrix groups. In other words, groups that aren't isomorphic to a closed subgroup of a matrix group. For example, you can take the metaplectic group of, over the reals, which is a double cover of the special linear group over the reals. And um, when we do the representation of the special linear group later on, it will follow that the metaplectic group um, um, can't be um, uh, a closed subgroup of any finite dimensional matrix group. Um, however, um, any finite dimensional Lie group is at least locally isomorphic to a matrix group. Um, and this means, at least for elements close to the identity, we can define an exponential map for this group by just sort of using the exponential map for the matrix group and using this local isomorphism. There's an alternative way of defining the exponential map for arbitrary groups, which doesn't use the fact they're locally isomorphic to matrix, matrix groups. What you, you, you take a group G, and you take the identity element and you take a, an element of the Lie algebra, which is a tangent space at the identity, and you can then extend this to the whole of G by left translation and get a vector field. And now what you can do is you can integrate this vector field. In other words, you, um, from this vector field, you get a map from the reals um, to the group G just by integrating this vector field by using a bit of differential geometry 
and this essentially is the same as the exponential map we defined earlier. Gives a one parameter um, group in G. But um, we're going to keep things simple and just talk about matrix groups for the rest of this lecture. Um, well, I, I said that x of a plus b was x of a times x of b if a b commute. So next we can ask what if a and b do not commute? Well, let's take a look. So we have x of a is equal to 1 plus a plus a squared over 2 plus higher terms. And we have x of b is equal to 1 plus b plus b squared over 2 plus higher terms we don't care about. And x of a plus b is equal to 1 plus a plus b plus and hit and that. now we've got a now we've got an a squared plus a b plus b a plus b squared over 2 plus higher order terms. And now if we multiply together these two things we get x of a times x of b and this is 1 plus a plus b plus a squared over 2 plus b squared over 2 plus a b plus higher order terms. Now let's compare these two expressions and you can see that they sort of differ a bit because on one of them we've got an a b plus b a and on the other hand we've just got an a b. So, um, so what we see is that x of a times x of b is equal to x of um, a plus b, but then we've got to add a correction factor for this. And you can see the difference between these is just a b minus b a over 2. So um, that will be, we get a plus a b over 2 here. Um, plus higher terms. Well, you can ask what are these higher terms? Well, there's actually a formula for these higher terms, um, which is due to Baker. Well, it's actually due to quite a lot of people. Um, the names Baker, Campbell, Hausdorff, and Dinkin, um, they all contributed quite a lot of these. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to postpone the discussion of these higher terms to next lecture. It turns out you can write all these higher order terms in terms of the Lie bracket of A and B. Um, so uh, let's see what the exponential map looks like in some simple cases. So let's take A to be a 2 by 2 matrix over the reals. And then we can ask what is X of A? And it's actually a little bit complicated to write down. First of all, we notice that a squared is equal to something times a plus something by um, because a satisfies its characteristic equation. Um, this is the Cayley-Hamilton theorem. In particular, a to the n is some linear combination of a and um, a constant. I guess I should put the identity matrix in there. Um, so the exponential of a is equal to something times a plus something times the identity matrix. So it's a linear combination of these two. And um, that's for two by two matrices. If we were doing n by n matrices, then it would be a linear combination of um, the identity in a and a squared up to a to the n minus one. Um, and now let's try and figure out what these constants are. Well, suppose a is diagonal. So suppose it's got eigen eigenvalues lambda and mu. Then x of a is equal to e to the lambda e to the mu. It's very easy to work out because powers of diagonal matrices are trivial. So if we want to write this as x times i plus y times lambda mu, which is a, we find e to the lambda is equal to x plus lambda y and e to the mu is equal to x plus mu y, from which it follows that y is equal to e to the lambda minus e to the mu over lambda minus mu, and x is equal to mu times e to the lambda minus lambda e to the mu over mu minus lambda. Or, um, and now we see that we can figure out what 
mu and lambda are because lambda plus mu is equal to the trace of a and mu times lambda is equal to the de determinant of a so that's just a d minus b c if we take our matrix a to be a b c d so this is just a plus d and now um, we see that um, we can use the same formulas for every, any diagonalizable matrix because um, we can just choose a basis in which it is diagonal and then we find this expression writing x with a in terms of the trace and the determinant of a still holds. So um, the, um, the exponential of the matrix is going to be x times i plus um, y times a where x and y are given by these expressions here which can be given in terms of a like that. So that works for all diagonalizable matrices. Not all matrices are diagonalizable of course but the diagonal matrices are dense so this formula actually holds by continuity for all matrices. So this gives a formula for the exponential of a 2 by 2 matrix at least it would do if I um, substituted everything in but that, that, that's a little bit messy. Um, next we can ask um, is, um, is the exponential map onto? So we've got an exponential map from the Lie algebra to the Lie group um, and well obviously it's not if the group is disconnected because the image of the exponential map must be connected so let's assume that G is connected. Um, well, first of all, we notice that it's at least um, an, a local isomorphism. So exp is a local isomorphism, and that's because it has a it has an inverse locally. So the inverse is given by log of one plus b is equal to b minus b squared over 2 plus b cubed over 3 and so on. And notice this does not converge for all matrices b. This at least converges for b having norm less than 1. And you can show that this is the inverse of the exponential map in pretty much the same way that you do for, for, real, um, for the real exponential and logarithm. Um, so um, it now, this, this makes it very plausible that x is on to. Um, so here's a plausible argument, which um, I better warn you in advance is actually false. It turns out that x isn't always on to, but it sort of looks as if it is going to be. So let's first of all say why it seems to be on to and then explain what's wrong with it. Um, so let's look at g. And let's take the identity element of E. Well, um, X is at least an isomorphism locally. So locally it will be, um, its image will at least contain a neighborhood of E. Well, now what we can do is um, we pointed out that X of A times X of B is equal to X of A plus B plus something and we mentioned earlier that we could write all terms of this in terms of the Lie bracket. And this seems to suggest that if we take um, some region which is in the image of exp, then we can always extend it a bit by choosing a point just inside the boundary of this region and we can then use this formula to extend the image of exp to something somewhat bigger and we can it sort of looks as if you can just continue like this until you've covered the entire group. So this sort of is a, it makes it look as if exp is onto but as I said this is actually wrong. Um, the problem is that this does not converge for all a and b. So um, this argument breaks down beyond a certain point and in fact the result is false. So we can cross this all out. The exponential map is not onto and this argument is just completely fallacious. 
Um, let's have an argument. Let, let's have an example where exp is not on two, and for this we just take the Lie algebra G to be um, the Lie algebra SL two R. This means um, matrices of trace zero, and we take the group G to be the group SL two of R which is matrices of determinant equal to one. Um, the convention is that you write a Lie group using capital letters and you sometimes write a Lie algebra using small letters, except I like using a capital L instead of a little g for, because g is, little g is used for other things. Um, and now let's try and think what, what the image of L must be. Well, if we look at SL2 of C instead, we can, we can, di we can diagonalize most matrices. So um, let's take the eigenvalues to be lambda and mu. And we know that lambda plus mu must be equal to zero. And now if this is diagonal, the eigenvalues of the exponential of this matrix will be e to the lambda and e to the mu. Um, and now let's try and figure out what these are. Well, um, um, th th there are two possibilities for what the um, eigenvalues in SL2 are must be. So either lambda and mu are both real, or they can both be both imaginary. And in this case, the eigenvalues of the exponential are either going to be e to the lambda e to the mu, which are going to be real greater than zero and product one, or they're going to be e to the something imaginary and e to the minus something imaginary. Um, these will be complex of absolute value equal to one. So if we draw the complex plane, we can see there are sort of two possibilities. Either the eigenvalues sort of look like this, so we've got some, some eigenvalue e to the minus lambda and e to the lambda, or they're going to be two complex numbers, both of absolute value one, which are complex conjugates of each other. In either case, we see that the trace of uh, e to the a is going to be greater than or equal to minus two, because in this case the trace is, is, is at least zero, in fact strictly positive, and in this case the trace is between minus two and two. So if we've got any element of SL2 of R of trace less than minus two, for example minus a half minus two, this is not in the image of the exponential map. Um, so, um, so the idea of the exponential map is that exp of um, a, a Lie algebra element is um, in the Lie group. And um, more generally, if we're given an element um, uh, A of the Lie algebra, then exp of lambda A is um, a homomorphism from the reals to the group. And we can ask if this also applies to infinite dimensional groups. Now usually I'm assuming that groups are finite dimensional um, and the reason for this is that infinite dimensional groups have several extra complications and I'm going to um, explain one of these now. So suppose we take G to be the diffeomorphisms of some manifold M. Then at the Lie algebra of G can be more or less the um, space of vector fields on M. And I'm putting this in inverted commas because actually pinning down the, the, the Lie algebra of an infinite dimensional Lie group is actually a surprisingly tricky technical problem. Well, let, let's sort of forget this for the moment and just try and see what happens if we just work naively. So what we should have is that, is that a vector field on M should give you 
um, a one parameter group of diffeomorphisms. And this is quite easy to describe geometrically. So here we've got a manifold and we've got some sort of vector field on it. And the corresponding diffeomorphism is quite easy to describe. What you do is you are just going to take a point on the manifold and follow this, um, follow this vector field for a given amount of time. And if we do that for every point, then it seems plausible that we get a diffeomorphism. So let's try and look at some examples and see what actually happens. So let's take the manifold M to be the reals, just for simplicity. Then a vector field is just going to be of the form f of x times d by dx for some x. And what we want to do is to kind of integrate this vector field to get a diffeomorphism of the real numbers. So um, and we might pick a point of the reals and then we might have a function x of t which is the image of the point, say a point x naught, um, if we follow the flow for time t. And what we see is that d by dt of x must be just f of x. Uh, that, that, that's just essentially saying that, 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 that x is following the, the, the flow of this vector field. Um, and we can solve this differential equation easily. It just says dt equals dx over f of x. So t is the integral from x naught to x of dx over f of x. And let's try this for a few examples. So suppose we put f of x equals 1. Well, that's pretty obvious what's going on. It just means we've got a sort of constant vector field. And not very surprisingly, this, this gives us t equals x minus x naught. Or in other words, x equals x naught plus t. In other words, not very surprisingly, if you start at any given point x naught and move along this vector field for time t, you get to the point um, x naught plus t. So that's just a translation. Not very interesting. If we take f of x equals x, it's kind of similar. We find t is the integral from x naught to x of dx over x which is equal to log of x over x zero. So x is equal to e to the t times x naught. So we're just, we're just sort of expanding um, the real line by, by something depending on t. Now let's try f of x equals x squared. So we've got the vector field x squared dx. And here we find t is equal to the integral from x zero to x of dx over x squared, which is 1 over x0 minus 1 over x. And now we find x is equal to x0 times 1 over 1 minus x0 t. And now we've suddenly got a problem because this becomes infinite at t equals 1 over x0. So um, what happens is we don't actually get a diffeomorphism for any non-zero value of t because um, what, what's happening is, is this vector field is getting big so quickly that if we start at a given point and run it for a finite amount of time we eventually hit the point infinity after a finite amount of time. So these two give you one parameter groups but this one does not. So we see that the relation between Vector fields and one parameter groups is kind of tricky. Some vector fields will give you one parameter groups, just like the exponential map, but some of them run into convergence problems. Um, actually, there's an even easier way to see that something goes wrong. Um, if instead of taking our um, manifold M to be the reals, we take the manifold M to be the unit interval, open unit interval zero to one, and now we take the vector field to be just um, d by dx. So the picture is here we've got an open unit interval and we've just got a constant vector field on it. 
And this ought to correspond to a one parameter group given by translations. So um, we, we, we would just have the function x equals x0 plus t. So after time t, we just move the point, um, we move each point to the right uh, distance of t. But this obviously fails because if we take a point here and move it to the right too far, we just fall off the end of the open unit interval. Um, and this suggests the problem is that the manifolds we're using are not compact. And if you stick to compact manifolds, then um, you can integrate vector fields um, more easily, basically because they, 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 they can't become arbitrarily large. OK, um, so next lecture we're going to discuss the Baker-Campbell-Hausdorff-Dinkin formula, which um, describes x of a times x of b in terms of x of a plus b.